Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Come on and bless the Lord with the fruit of your lips standing on your feet all over the building. God is great and greatly to be praised. Come on, if you have breath in your body and life in your lungs and you came to give God the praise on this evening, come on and bless the Lord. If we set the atmosphere, he has no other choice but to show up tonight. If we set the atmosphere, deliverance will take
you lift up your hands and say, Hallelujah. There's no God like Jehovah. Every hand lifted in the sanctuary, every hand lifted. I searched all over and still couldn't find nobody. And God, we tell you that you deserve it. We lift our hands this evening and we say that you deserve it. You deserve it, yes, you do. Yes, yes, you do. Hallelujah. Singer, come on. You deserve. Jesus. You deserve it. You deserve it. Yes, you do, Jesus. You deserve it. 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 You deserve it
stand one more time if you will tonight because we're in worship we're in worship tonight and I believe God deserves some good worship tonight I said I believe God deserves some good worship tonight now listen listen I know I know I know some things you're seeing this week may not look like what you're used to but our general secretary told us on last evening that God is delivering us some fresh bread and I just believe tonight that God is ushering us in this opening worship service into a new space. Into a space that's going to catapult us to a new dimension in him. And so I want to invite you tonight. I, I don't want to push you. I don't want to try to praise lead you into something. But I want from the very altars of your heart, if you will tonight, as we begin this worship, can we have a shout from Zion that will let God know that we're ready for whatever he's up to in our life? I just want if there's any Zionites tonight who, who really believe that God is up to something in our life. And though some of us may not be in this space and we may be virtual, the same God that's here it's the same God that's at the airport. It's the same God that's going over the internet. And I believe that as Zion, we can worship God. Like, can we just give him a shout? Hallelujah. Can we give God a shout? Because as, as we go into worship, here, here's what I believe. I, I, I believe something. We're, we're, we're practicing, you know, good faith with good sense by having, you know, not touching. But if we could touch each other's hands tonight and feel each other's hand, I believe you would be touching the hand of a miracle. I, I just believe that the person standing beside you, you would touch a miracle tonight. Because you really don't know what they had to go through just to get here. I wish I had about five of y'all who knew what I was talking about. That, that miracle that's standing beside you, you don't know what it took for them to get here. And since we're all here, and we all been blessed by the power of God, somebody ought to give him some praise in this place. Jesus. 
worshipers. Yeah. Worship the Father. Yeah. In spirit. Yeah. And yeah. in truth. Yeah. And I just wonder, is there anybody in here who knows God is deserving of it? Yeah. And you're not concerned about what I look like and what clothes I have on it. But all you know is I got an audience of one and he's deserving of my worship. So Father, have your way in this space. Do whatever you want to do. We have a program, but it's okay if you take over. And do whatever you want to do. Somebody give God a shout of praise. You may be seated. I know y'all not gonna let that sister praise him. If I'm all right, Bishop, let, let me just say, the last time I checked, you know, we are the Freedom Church. That last time I checked, we are the Freedom Church. And when I check, you know, scripture, it says, whom the Son sets free. So listen, if you're sitting there, I know, I, I don't mean to get on about it. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, you know, who I am and I can't be anything else. So if you're sitting there and you're saying, well, that's not Zion. Well, you can't be free and bound at the same time. You either free or you're still trying to get free. And I just wonder, are there any free people out there who don't mind getting this worship service started, started right? And say, if I'm gonna be free, I'm just gonna be free. I'm just, and I'll deal with the rest later on. But right now, I'm gonna be all right. We gotta go on. Listen, we got a lot to do tonight, but we're gonna give God some good praise tonight. We're gonna praise him. Yes, we are. Because he's been good to all of us. And he deserves it, y'all. You just got through singing, my hallelujah belongs to you. So we're going to give God good praise. Listen, we're going to move on in the service. But I feel mighty nice, y'all. feel good. feel good in here. And we're going to call Sister Johnson Young to come and lead us in prayer. After which, we're going to have the wonderful voices from the Midwest to come and to bless us in singing. And then our general secretary is going to come with our purpose and occasion. Will you just continue to give God praise and just shout hallelujah? Amen, hallelujah. Cause it's the highest praise. Amen, amen. I feel like we need to usher in a spirit of thanksgiving in this place, amen. Some of us came here by plane, train, 
Automobile, Uber, however we got here, we made it. And those that are watching virtually, you're here with us as well. Let us go to the throne of grace. Amen. Eternal and all-wise and everlasting God, the Truth Field 2022 Reunion Family is coming before you on tonight just to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us back together again, in person or virtually. We just want to thank you. Thank you for keeping us during the time that we were not together these past three years. Lord, you kept us through some tumultuous times, through a pandemic that we're still in, through an insurrection, Lord. You kept us through corrupt leadership at the highest level of our country. Lord, you are a keeper. You are a healer. You are a sustainer. You are a deliverer. Lord, we continue to thank you, even for bringing us through the day-to-day -day challenges that we have in our lives. Help us to know that you are a lifter of our heads. You are a provider. And we just say, thank you. Lord, I want to thank you for our beloved AME Zion Church, Lord. Thank you for our Episcopal leaders. Thank you for our Christian education leadership. Thank you for all who are assembled here tonight. Lord, I want to say a special prayer for our General Secretary, Lord, the Reverend Patrick Barrett II, Lord. He is the most anointed person I know. He's poured his heart and his mind into planning this. And Lord, there's been so many things that have just kind of went awry, but we know that all things work for the good, for those who love you. And I don't know about you, we love you, Lord. We love you, we praise you, Lord. And as we go further into this worship experience, we hope that we will not leave here the same way that we came. And even in the installation, Lord, of the VICYC and the Yakum and the ACE, Lord, help us, Lord, to know that it's not about the name and the position, but what it is that we're going to do as we move forward in Christian education. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord, because you're worthy to be praised. Do what you want to do as long as you want to. In Jesus' name we pray. And we thank you. And we seal this prayer. And everyone that was in agreement say it. Amen. Amen. And amen. God be praised.
put your hands together and give God a hand clap of praise in this house. Amen. The Midwest Mass Choir. The best is in the Midwest. That's what they tell us. Come on, come on, come on. We've come to bless the name of the Lord, and we want you to help us on today Hallelujah. as we lift up his holy name. Search the stars to knock on heaven's door. Creation groans for God to be revealed. Every wound we carry will be healed. My eyes on the sun.
you to lift up a sign of praise right now. Yeah. Oh, and if you ever wonder what heaven looks like, look at your neighbor and say, it's looking like me and you. you're saying let it fill the room let it fill the room the feeling of expectation that God is up to something is there a witness in the house tonight that I didn't come all this way without some great expectation but I'm expecting God to show up in my story I'm expecting him to show up in my life is there a witness tonight hallelujah Hallelujah. Come on, can we celebrate God for the Midwest Episcopal District Mass Choir? Hallelujah. Come on, let's celebrate them. Come on, let's celebrate them. On tonight, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's nothing like having great expectation. I know what the weather reports are, but I'm still expecting God. I know I need y'all to pray for me, but I'm still, I'm okay. I'm expecting God because I know I didn't, we haven't gone, we haven't toiled for God not to move. I haven't stayed up until 3 a.m. for God not to show up. So I might be by myself. I'm okay. Pray for me. But God is showing up in the space. God is moving in our situation. I wish I had some help right there. That is expecting God to move. I told the officers last night that sometimes when things don't go your way, you better pay attention because it might be an indicator. It might be an indicator that God is getting ready to show up. <laughs> don't bend. Don't break. Don't throw in the towel. Don't throw a temper tantrum. Don't quit the church. Don't let go. Don't quit. You might shed a tear, but don't you dare let go. Because his strength is made perfect <laughs> in your weakness. I look for God in the imperfection because that's when God shows up God moves when it don't go my way and you know what even if it ain't my plan it's still the master's plan and if I'm in his hands I think that will be alright is there a witness today so my friends if you're watching virtually you might not be here but the spirit can meet you wherever you are you might be in the airport, but the Spirit can meet you right where you are. And so I'm blessed on tonight because God is already moving. We haven't even been here a full day yet, but God has showed up in some marvelous ways. And he's coming, and it ain't over yet. Y'all, we just getting started. God is in the room. He's moving in our situation and we are believing today that God is going to show up in some wonderful ways here at Truthville 2022. Is there a witness today? Do you expect that? Are you believing that today? Amen. 
amen, 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 amen. My task on tonight, of course, is to welcome you. We've done that earlier, uh, but we also, tonight is tribe night. Uh, where we are gathering together to celebrate the Episcopal areas of our beautiful, beloved Zion. And we want to take a moment as we celebrate on tonight to honor God for the Christian education leadership of our Episcopal directors of Christian education. We are blessed in the AME Zion Church to have a wonderful team of Christian education directors. So won't you help me, Eastern North Carolina? Are you in the house? Let's praise God for Sister Portia Jacobs, the Episcopal Director of the Eastern North Carolina Episcopal District. Piedmont, are you in the house? We praise God for Dr. Ramon Hunt and Dr. Thomas Grinter, your Episcopal Directors. Northeastern, are you in the house? Come on, let's praise God for Sister Sarah Lynn Tate, our Episcopal Director in Northeastern. South Atlantic, are you in the house? Make some noise for Sister Yolanda Knox. Uh, Midwest, are you in the house? Come on, let's celebrate God for Sister Deborah Rivers. Amen. 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 Southwestern Delta, are you in the house? Let's give it up for Sister Ava Swinton, who was also our third vice chair. Western Episcopal District, are you in the house? Give it up for Reverend Naila Hubbard, uh, the Episcopal Director of the Western Episcopal District. Now look here, I know that y'all keep saying the best is in the Midwest, but while I got the mic, say amen. It's a blessing to have the mic. I know the best is in the Mid-Atlantic Episcopal District. Mid-Atlantic, are you in the house? We praise God for Reverend David Miller and Reverend Dr. Sandy Hutchinson, our Episcopal Directors of Christian Education. Amen. So come on, let's celebrate God for our Zion on tonight and the joy it is to be connected one to another. Amen. Amen. We've also come to a very important part in our worship. On t huh? Oh, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Lord have mercy, Jesus. I'm going to deal with this later, y'all. Because that particular director is my bestie. <laughs> I'm going to deal with this later. But I was just saving, okay. Alabama, Florida. Alabama, Florida. No, y'all all got to get up. Alabama, Florida. Are you in the house? Make some noise. We call her the general, Reverend Leslie Simpson. Amen, amen. I love you, Reverend. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We praise God for our Episcopal directors of Christian education and the work that they offer to our beloved Zion. We also come to this moment on tonight. Uh, many of you know that in our uh, July quadrennial convention on Christian education, uh, we were blessed to elect new officers for the 2022-2026 20, uh, term in the Connectional Christian Education Department. And we are blessed tonight to join with all of our officers. We didn't want to do it virtually. We knew that we were going to be together at the reunion. And so we wanted to take this moment to officially install not only our officers, but our Connectional Christian Education Department staff. We are a new, an, a, in a new season. The Lord is launching us out into a new season of ministry and leadership together. And so tonight we want to invite our officers and staff to fill the altar uh, as we together are installed by the leadership of Bishop Darren Moore and Mrs. Ava Swinton. So all of our officers, if you would stand, all of our connectional staff, amen. Let's give it up for our officers and our staff. We're going to invite you to come forward, VICYC. Amen. Let's celebrate God for the leadership of the Varick International Christian Youth Council. 
for the young adults in Christian ministry and the assembly of Christian educators. Y'all scoot down just a little bit and face the stage and then our connectional officers. If you would come, keep coming, keep coming. Ace, Ace, I'm sorry, Ace. This is an important moment as we launch out together as a global team of Christian education leaders. Fill in, fill in. If you will come, and then we'll have our staff to come behind our officers. Come on, one more time. Let's make some noise for our. Amen. Amen. Staff, if you would come, if you would come and join with us. Beloved, this is a critical moment in the life of our church. For while every department across Zion has a valuable ministry, the ministry of discipleship determines the health and vitality of our church. We can win people to Christ but we've got to help people grow in Christ. And so beloved, let's not get caught up in what the culture says a successful church is. Bands, numbers, buildings, budgets. Let's change the paradigm for successful ministry and ask, are we helping to mature disciples in Christ? That's your assignment. Anybody can have a title. We got a lot of titles in the church. Anybody could have a title. Pharaoh had a title. But God ought to give you a testimony. Pharaoh had a title, Moses had a testimony. Saul had a title. David had a testimony. Herod had a title. But Jesus had a testimony. Trump had a title. Barack Obama got a testimony. Don't just carry your title share your testimony don't get caught up in your position pursue your purpose can I tell you the truth if I were out of my purpose I would give up this title of a bishop because what profiteth a man if he got a fancy title yes. and loses soul. Yes. Beloved, pursue your purpose. I'm going to ask my colleagues to come and stand with us because this represents our church. Amen. Amen. Both active and retired. If you'll come on this platform and let's just spread out so that you can stretch your hands out when it comes our moment to pray for these leaders. We're reminded when we're consecrated bishops that we embody the whole church and that we are the visible unity as bishops of the whole church. When you see these bishops standing here, they recognize 
how valuable, how important your role is, your ministry is, your purpose is. So when we get to the end and they stretch forth their hands, they are embodying the entire million of members around the world of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. I have one request from you. Allow your life to be so filled by the power of the Holy Spirit with integrity that somebody's life will be different because they saw your life. Will you do that? Through the election and the selection process, members have demonstrated their faith in your leadership and ability to carry out the duties of the office or the staff role of your respective organizations within the Christian Education Department. They have recognized your loyalty to the aims and purposes along with your dedication to upholding the Constitution and bylaws of your respective units. We meet here and now at this installation service in the presence of Almighty God that we may recognize his call upon those who have been elected to leadership positions within the church, God's church. We have confidence that you will prove yourselves to be a workman that needeth not be ashamed. You now present yourselves in response to the call of the church and to be installed into further active duties of your roles. It is, a, it is appropriate now that you answer the following questions. Beloved, do you willingly accept the responsibilities of the role to which you have been elected or appointed? And do you promise to perform the duties of the office as diligently and effectively as possible? If so, you will all answer, I do. Do you endeavor to lead an exemplary Christian life, to set a proper example for the members of your respective organizations by agreeing to live in harmony with the African Methodist Episcopal Zion discipline as you perform your duties within the Christian Education Department? If so, answer, I do so with the help of the Holy Spirit. I do so with the help of the Holy Spirit. Will you promote the peace, unity, and effectiveness of the church? and in cooperation with other staff and officers, fostering the blending of all efforts to fulfilling the mission statement of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church and the vision, mission, and themes of the Christian Education Department. And will you pray daily for the church? If so, answer, I will do so with the help of Jesus Christ. God has endowed each of us with unique gifts and talents for the edification of the church and the work of ministry. Will you accept this church office in proportion to your faith to minister, to teach, to give liberally, to lead with diligence, and to show mercy with cheerfulness? Officers, staff, before you is your affirmation. Will you read it aloud in unison? As my colleagues 
stretch forth their hands representing the unity and the purpose and the power of the great freedom church oh God our Savior and Lord may you uphold and direct these your people so that they may go forth as elected and appointed staff and officers but more importantly not just elected and appointed but may they each be anointed may they be so anointed for the positions that they will hold yes. that the power will, will flow through them yes. and impact the people that they serve remind them god it's not about them yes yes it's not about their power it's not about their position it is not about their status yes. Yes. it's about your glory so have your way in their yes. lives, oh yes, God. Lord. Yes, Lord. And transform their ministries in such a way that lives will be transformed yes. through the ministry of the Christian Education Department of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And the people of God all over this assembly who agree and who support will lift their voices and say together, praise, praise. be to God. Praise be to God. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise one more time for our newly installed officers and staff? Amen. We're going to continue to move in worship. The Midwest Episcopal Mass Choir will come back and bless us in singing, after which we will be blessed with the spoken word of Sister Ellen Ike. Let's receive them as they shall come. Let's continue to praise God.
leave me with a mic in my hand? Does anybody know that he is the lifter of your head? Well, let me ask you a question. Is there anybody in here whose head has ever been down? Then you already know that he is a lifter. Come on, I'm waiting for somebody to take the mic. He is a lifter.
God. Yes, God.
bless his name. Bless his name. Thank God for the move of his spirit. To God be the glory. Amen. What an awesome God. What an awesome God. What an awesome God. We're going to continue in the same flow. The same anointing. And I'm going to ask Bishop Thompson, would he come at this time? How many know that he's worthy to be praised? As we continue in the spirit of worship, we're going to prepare for our offering. Don't stop worshiping because God allowed us the opportunity to worship him in spirit and in truth. Today when we got here, finance committee, you come on and get ready. We, we got here. And it's ironic that Bishop Moore would ask me to ask to receive this offering. In my terminology, I don't take an offering, I receive it. Because if I wanted to take it, I'd come take what I want. But you give freely. But when we got to our room today, the room was like Little Red Riding Hood. Somebody had already been sleeping in our beds. And we called down to the front desk and said to them, something is wrong, y'all gonna have to fix this. We can't be in no unclean room. Somebody stayed here last night. And they apologized profuse, profusely and said, we're gonna send up the housekeeper. They send the housekeeper up and we go to another room to wait. And Bishop Frencher, it was something strange. When I go back to check to make sure they're really clean in the room, a young lady who is the housekeeper supposed to get off at five o'clock, but they call her back. Bishop George Edward Battle Jr. taught me in 1993 when I was his driver and they were calling me the bishop's boy. Now I'm the boy that's the bishop. It's just amazing to me. He said, always leave an offering for housekeeping, because that's somebody's mama, that's somebody's sister, somebody's paying for somebody's college by cleaning somebody else's room. So I walked in and I gave her, Reverend Barnett, I gave her an offering, I gave her a tip. And when I gave her the tip, she lighted up and said, thank you so much. I said, well, now I gotta go get ready for church. I'll see you later after you've cleaned the room. She started to tear up in her eye and said, thank you for this offering. I said, no, that's a tip. She said, what's the difference between the offering and the tip? I said, I'm glad you asked me. I said, a tip is a byproduct. It's a crumb, it's a morsel, it's a dangling participle that comes from me sowing the offering. She says, well, you've already given your offering tonight. I said, no, 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 I gave you the tip. It's because I give an offering, I have a tip to give you. She says, so you're trying to tell me that when I give my offering, Reverend Jaime, God will provide tips. I said, he'll provide overflow. I said, he does that. So you will just know that give unto him and he shall open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. She said, well, let me send my offering down there with you. And she handed me this $5 bill and said, because I'm in the need of overflow. I said, girl, you better not start up in here. She said, just take my offering. I said, well, put it in your right hand. And I said, when you put it in your right hand, you declare this is your offering unto God. She said, it ain't but $5. I said, let me tell you something. It ain't about it being $5. It's about where it came from. I didn't know housekeepers in Chicago shouted in hotel room. But this lady gave her offering and it was so profound to me that she was so excited over the tip I gave but I wanted to let her know it wasn't greater than the offering because God provides a way for us to be able to give the offering. And we don't give it so we can get back. We give it because it belongs to God. So tonight we're gonna ask you to get $20 in your hand or $20 on your phone. 
The Christian Education Department is going to put the giving platform on the screen. That's the way you give. And I'm going to ask everyone to stand to your feet as we get ready to give. We're asking for $20 to be sewn into good soul. And we're going to walk whether you give electronically or not. I want you to come and give this offering to the glory of God. Because you may say, well, it could do more in my pocket. But in your pocket is only $20. But when you put it in the hands of the Lord, press down, shaking together, and running over, how many know that God will be able to give you something that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard? So we're going to put, put your offering in your hand and hold up your phone. Say, Lord, I present this offering unto you, not because Bishop asked for it, but because it was the requirement of me to give back to you not looking for anything but looking unto you and I sow this into good soil and I ask you to receive it and bless it in Jesus name amen come on and give God glory we get ready to give our offering we're going to ask that those that are in the center aisle we're going to ask you to face each other y'all face each other and I'm going to ask you to come. You, you're on the back row. You don't need the usher to lead you. You know we do it every Sunday in church. All right. Just come right on. Just come on each side. Those persons that are on this side, turn to the wall. Turn to the wall. Come around from that back corner and come around. Those persons that are over here, I want you to face that wall. And I want you to come around. And there are the persons up front. Whoever's at the corner right here at the back, come on around and come around. Come on and come around. Who's ever back there in the corner? Just come on. Somebody lead them. Y'all help them. Center, you got it right. There you go. Y'all moving over there. And the Thompson Angelic Supremes from on high will sing for us today.
Everyone stand as we bless the offering. Will you repeat after me? All things come of thee. O oh Lord, and of thine own have we given unto thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Let's put our hands together. Thank God for these gifts. Thank God for this music ministry. Whoa! Midwest! Look at y'all. Go ahead. Amen. Thank God for these musicians and this director. Amen. These directors. Amen. What a blessing it is. And now I present to you Sister Ellen Ike. Praise God. Reflection by Shakar Pearson. Lace your shoes for this walk down memory lane. The good times that will never replace or ever remake. Remember the endeavors we chased, the measures we faced, our God who met us with grace. And it's in Christ we shall forever remain. So together unto him, let us give praise. Welcome, I'm setting the stage, a mere feather in place clinging to the shadow of his incredible wings. Remember, the doubt that we bring kills. If we don't change, don't expect things will, we're the bride of Christ, once living single. No affidavits, his hand has sustained us. The path he gave us is like Athanasia. Even faith was giving, it's not our own. We spread the fire that shuts up our bones. We need each other, no matter what we're doing in life. Looking to the sun because we're rooted in Christ. Thriving, not surviving. And we're moving through strife. Once in darkness, now exuding his light. We enjoy the smiles, love, and joy when they happen. Who cares about hardship when you know the craftsman? A blacksmith purifies gold through a furnace to remove impurities and it doesn't deserve it. How long does it take? Isn't the question. He passes it through until he sees his reflection. What does this mean? I guess you are asking. Looks like Will isn't only the blacksmith. Our purity no one can defile, looking more like Christ with every test and trial. Elders, bishop, pastors, we give you our plaudits. We wouldn't be here without God, let us be honest. Hanging on with a strong grip to his promise, you can still see the fresh prints on his garment. Look at how much this conference has improved. We're never choosing to stop. Answering the door when opportunity knocks. We made it through the pandemic and tragedies. Remember, one day we will behold his majesty. Now, let's get in depth into these messages. May each segment be where your next blessing is reminding you of the mud you were brought out of, God's love you couldn't miss out on, activating nostalgia. Reflect and journey with me down the bucolic scenery that we call memories.
Job chapter 2, verse 20. And when Job heard this, he tore his clothes, shaved his head, and because of his great sorrow, he knelt on the ground, then worshiped God. My assignment this evening is learning to thrive in the face of hardship. If I could hashtag a subtitle, it would be good times. Let us pray. God, do what only a God can do in a way that only a God can do it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, many of us know, in fact, all of us, regardless of age, gender, status, color, and culture, we all at some point have and will experience hardship. Webster defines hardship as severe suffering or privation, great tribulation, and adversity. And we as believers are not strangers to hardship. In fact, some of us uh, know hardship quite well. Psalms 34 declares that many are the afflictions or hardships of the righteous, but we find peace in knowing that the Lord will deliver us from it all. But how many of us will be honest with ourselves and admit that although Psalms 34 gives us a sense of comfort when faced with hardship while standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with adversity, despite what we know, we still feel the blow. Yeah, some of us, we don't respond well to hardship. In fact, I'll be the first to admit, uh, Lady Newton, that I am not the best at responding to hardship. Hardship has a way of paralyzing me. It puts a halt on my progression, and it causes me to stand still. No movement at all. And truthfully, while experiencing hardship, I'm really not concerned with trying to thrive. Honestly, while in the middle of a hardship, I'm just trying to survive. And sadly, we've become accustomed to surviving hardship when it is the intent, the very will of God that we don't survive hardship, but we thrive through hardship. Meaning in the midst of the calamity, in the midst of the suffering, it is God's will that we prosper, we expand, we flourish, and we bloom. The question remains, Reverend Barrett, how do I thrive in the face of hardship? My first and only point, we must develop a kingdom perspective. Understand this is easier said than done simply because many of us, if not all of us in this room are saved. We confess to be Christians, meaning we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Many of us are Christians, but very few of us are Christians kingdom and kingdom Christians have adopted a kingdom mindset that alters or changes how we respond to hardship. I can show you better than I can tell you here in our text. Y'all know the story. Job, the richest man in the land, is now experiencing hardship at its best. If I could paraphrase, the Salbians and a gang of Chaldeans came and stole Job's livestock. Fire came from heaven, burned up his cattle, his offspring, his children were partying in the house, and a strong wind came and blew the house down. Further in the text, we find that the hardship and the suffering did not stop there. But Job, his body became infested with boils and sores. But because of Job's response to hardship, Pastor Quavon, I am left to conclude that Job possessed a kingdom perspective. Because when he faced hardship, the Bible says that Job, he tore off his robe, he shaved his head, and he worshipped. Here, Job gives us the formula to thriving in the face of hardship. Understand when faced with adversity, Job didn't respond like some of us. No, Job didn't fuss. He didn't cuss. He didn't fall into a depression. He didn't have a pity party. He didn't blame God. No, the text says Job worshipped. Perhaps Job knew the power 
of worship. Maybe Job understood that if I am to thrive through this, then I must take my hardship and mix it with my worship. Perhaps Job knew that when you take hardship and combine it with worship, then heaven is obligated to war on your behalf, meaning heaven must now respond and release the power that is needed to ensure that the hardship, the trial, and the test doesn't knock you over and the hardship doesn't wipe you out. Yeah, a kingdom perspective will always mix hardship with worship. A kingdom perspective will force your natural mind to believe that although your situation doesn't look good, it doesn't feel good. If you worship in the middle of the adversity, then heaven will release power to thrive and power to persevere, to excel and rise above your hardship. Possessing a kingdom perspective will alter your mind. It will force you to believe that with hardship mixed with worship, you can turn a bad season into a good time. You can turn a bad season into a good time. Get good times. Maybe you never suffered like Job suffered. Maybe you can't relate to Job, but perhaps you can see yourself in Florida and James Evans. Y'all remember February 8th, 1974. I was zero years old. CBS aired its first episode of Good Times. Good Times tells the story of a black family who grew up in a Chicago housing project and they struggled to make ends meet. Their father, James Evans, was in and out of jobs and couldn't find decent work. And as I was writing this sermon, I was reminded of season one, episode two. JJ is in the living room and Thelma asks him, do you know what today is? And JJ says, it's Blue Monday followed by Broke Tuesday and Disaster Wednesday. And the rest of the week goes downhill. But can I tell you, later on in the episode, something must have got a hold of JJ. He must have instantly developed a kingdom perspective because while experiencing hardship, JJ began to list the bad things. And then he listed the good things. And then he realized that the bad did not outnumber the good. And because the bad did not outnumber the good, then it is safe to conclude that although we are struggling, these are still good times. I'm on the way back to my seat, but I just came to Chicago to tell somebody in the room who may be right smack in the middle of the hardship. I came to prophesy that these are still good times. Yeah, maybe you're in a job and maybe your good health. Maybe like the Evans family, your finances are funny. You are struggling to make ends meet. You robbed Peter to pay Paul and Paul never got his money. You struggled to make it to Chicago and you don't even know what life will look like when you get home. But the Lord said if you would develop a kingdom perspective, if you would only combine your hardship with worship, just survive I want to thrive Lord give me a kingdom perspective amen Father it's in these moments that we come with thanksgiving in our hearts First, thanking you, God, for the opportunity that you have given unto all of us 
God, we pray in this moment that your word would go forth and that your people would be blessed. Set my soul on Holy Ghost fire. Fill my cup, O oh God, until I want no more. Allow your people to be different at the benediction than they were at the call to worship. God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. For Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. And all of God's children said together, amen. My task or assignment for tonight is embracing new opportunities and new chances to start over. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, help us with our conversation tonight. And it reads, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press, somebody shout press, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If I could tag a topic to this text, I would like to use a necessary transition. A necessary transition. In 2016, Veronica Ray Saran shared this interesting fact in her article for Medium in a surprisingly honest confession. The millennial writer writes these words. Conversation after conversation, it has become more and more clear. Those among us with flashy Instagram accounts perfectly manufactured LinkedIn profiles and confident exteriors are probably those who are feeling the most confused, anxious, and stuck when it comes to the future. The millennial 20-something stuckness sensation is everywhere, and there is different co a direct correlation between those who feel it and those who put off a vibe of feeling extremely secure. My brothers and sisters, today many of us have found ourselves stuck. We are stuck in relationships. We are stuck on jobs that seemingly have us going in circles or even some cases nowhere. We are stuck outside and inside the church. We are stuck in tradition. We are stuck in ritual. And don't get me wrong lest we forget that we are built on the foundation of tradition and ritual. If it had not been for the tradition and the ritual, we wouldn't be standing in the places that we stand today. But the question that I have for you is what happens when it seems like tradition is becoming tragic? and rituals are becoming risky. It becomes detrimental to the well-being of the church. We are stuck in what's modern instead of embracing what's right. We are stuck in what seems popular instead of the prophetic movement of God. This not moving anywhere, not trying to experience the new of anything because where we are is a comfortable place, a place where things have always been the way they are. Y'all, this place that we are in has taken a mysterious relevance because in the 21st century, church. All a lot of us can focus on is being stuck here and don't want to find out how we can get from here to over there. We don't want to change what we do or how we do it because we would rather stay stuck than offend somebody. We don't want to move our methods of worship because we've always did it this way. We've always sung these hymns. We've always followed the extensive outline of the program and we would rather stay stuck in what we've always done rather than allow the spirit to direct and guide us. Y'all we found ourselves to be stuck. Uh, just like Will in the first place, y'all don't believe it, Will found himself to be stuck. A brother from West Philadelphia who thought he had it under control. He knew the streets, he knew the ladies, he knew all, everything he thought he needed to know to survive in West Philly. Well, one day on a playground, a place where it was said that he spent most of his time, he was playing basketball. He was shooting around the shoulder over the back hook. The ball would bounce off the rim, hit a gang member, and then never start a fight. Word would get back to his mother so she sent him to live with his aunt and uncle in Bel Air in order to not only save him but to give him a fresh start. But the thing I like the most about it y'all Will took what was given to him and tried his best to make the most out of it almost to the point of seeming like he was bringing West Philly to Bel Air with him. I can't think of any other experience y'all than that of Paul when he said I count myself not to be apprehended but this one thing I do I feel forget those things which are behind and I reach forth into those things that are before. Paul is saying to the believer he's given us a challenge because Paul at this present moment is stuck behind prison bars. However he is still being productive. The text beloved teaches us three things lest I hold you too long imperative to embrace an unnecessary transition. The first thing you must do is learn how to forget. Uh, don't think on the things of your past. Don't think 
on the things that you had once before or once been through or even the people that were once in your circle. Paul starts this chapter by suggesting that we have to break away from the past and move on with the future. I want to drop something in your spirit for free tonight. We've got to stop bringing the things that God took us away from into our new season. If God intended for you to have the things that you were bringing, he wouldn't have tried to take you away from it. Second thing the text teaches you is that you have to learn how to focus. But in focusing, we are not to focus on what is behind us, but rather focus on the thing that God has waiting for us. See, the enemy's job in this season of transition for your life is to try his best to distract you from where you are moving to or remind you of everything that you left. He'll come and he'll show you what you think you're missing and give you a clear view of what you thought you needed. That's a big reason why some of us can't embrace the new that God has for us because we are too focused on seeing just how much of the old stuff that we can hang on to. Can I speak a word for somebody as you get ready to move into 2023? In 2023, the word that you need to take with you is that you need to learn how to let it go. That's not deep. That won't shout all of you. But in this next season of your life, all God needs you to do is let it go. You've been carrying too much baggage into too many seasons for too long in your life. And God is telling you that it's time for you to let it go. Well, Balor, why do I need to let it go? Because there's better in store for me. God has greater with my name on it. Stop focusing on what you have and start looking at what God is about to give you and learn how to let it go. I wonder is there anybody in here that's ready to declare over your life that this is my let it go season. I can't carry it anymore. I can't deal with what I've been dealing with. I can't cry the same tears that I've been crying because the same people have been doing the same things. I've got to learn how to let it go. Paul said, I'm forgetting those things that are behind and I'm pressing toward the mark of the prize. So Will, y'all, he's at this place. bel is an interesting place for him, but he embraces it. He gets to the point in his journey that although he struggled with the change, he started to embrace the new possibility that he was facing. Y'all know the story. He starts to become really popular. His basketball skills were starting to be displayed. All of these things that he once knew were helping to make him into the person that he was set to become. And as I draw near to my close, I've got to be rather honest with you, my friends, and let you know that that's something that we find difficult to do in this season. Mainly because we'll always have someone or something that is ready to throw our past in our face. In this season of my life, y'all, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be around people that are so stuck on where I've been that they can't recognize where I'm going. I had to come to the realization that in order for me to embrace a necessary transition, I had to realize that where I've been was a test. But now in the place that I'm in, I have a testimony. Yes, I might have done that in my last season. Yes, I might have said that in my last season. Yes, at one point that might have been me, but that was all a part of the test. But come here, grandmama, help me tell my testimony. Oh, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Yes, I have a past, and I thank God for my past. Will had a past. Y'all know the story. If it wasn't for the streets of West Philly, he wouldn't have learned the skills that he had. If it wasn't for a basketball game going bad, he wouldn't have gotten into a fight with a gang member. If he hadn't gotten into the fight, he wouldn't have had to move to Bel Air. If he didn't have to move to Bel Air, he wouldn't have experienced Philip and Vivian Banks, the big house or the luxurious life. And if it wasn't for the past before Bel Air, the Fresh Prince would have never existed. Will had a past. Paul had a past. And guess what, y'all? I have one too. If it wasn't for my past, I wouldn't be who I am today. If it wasn't for my past, some of these doors wouldn't have opened. If it wasn't for my past, some places I've been, I wouldn't have had to go. If it wasn't for my past, I wouldn't have met some of the people that I met. My past helped make me, and now I can say, look where God has brought me from. Third point, I've got to go, but you've got to learn how to move forward. Don't get stuck in the place of your past, because God has a future, a new place, and a new season with your name on it. Forget those things that are behind, and reach forth to those things that are ahead. Somebody shout press towards the things that are ahead of you. I know my last season 
it was rough. I know that I had to go through in my last season, but I had to deal with it in order to get to the place that God wanted me to be. So I stand here today, not like Paul, not like Will, but just as I am, declaring that the transition was necessary. God had to move me from the place of where I was to the place that he needed me to be. And I can't think of any other way to bid you a farewell rather than to quote the words of the prophets by the name of Fantasia. I am who I am today because God, he used my mistakes. He worked them for my good like no one else ever could. It was necessary. It was necessary because God used mistakes and work them for my good. Somebody do me a favor and declare that the season was necessary. You had to go through it. You had to deal with it. You had to hurt. You had to cry. You had to get frustrated. But God took what the enemy meant for evil and turned it around for your good. Somebody shout it was necessary. You had to Father, I need you more than I've ever needed you before. And I pray right now in Jesus' name that you'll dip me down in wisdom's well and bring me up, O oh God, that I'll only say what you'll have me to say. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be found acceptable in thine sight. For you, God, are my strength and my redeemer. Simply is my prayer. Bless the work of my hands. In Jesus' name, we do pray, and those who believed it said amen. amen. My task is to re simply remind you that no matter how high you go, you still need God. Our scripture this evening will come from the book of Luke, Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 39, and it reads thus wise. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in the town who had lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And when she wiped them with her hair, she kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. This topic for this time that is ours is my oil matters. Do me a favor and help me feel like I'm back in page and let somebody know that my oil matters. The truth of the matter is, is that you did not press your way all the way from where you are from to Chicago to simply sit on your good gifts. You did not press your way all the way through every single airport, every train station, and every bus station just to be able to feel like you're a number and not a name. I need somebody to understand that you have a purpose in this season and there is a reason for your destiny. There is a reason why you've been through the things that you have been through. There is a reason why you have cried the tears that you have cried. There is a reason why you had to press your way all the way through because the oil on your life is produced by the testimony that you have on your life. Ah, uh, y'all gotta talk to me. And so in the scenes of living single, you have all of these different characters and they all have their own personalities. But the truth of the matter is, is they could not stand alone without each other. 
And what happens here in the body is that we feel isolated because I might not be the best singer. I might not be the best preacher. I might not be the best one to lead every song. But since I'm willing and I'm able, I'm here right now. I need somebody who will give God praise and say, listen, I'm willing and I'm able to be able to do whatever God needs me to do. Even if you call my name last, I'm still willing to be able to do anything God needs me to do. Even if I don't talk the way that you want me to talk, I'm still right here, willing and able to be used by God. Can I tell my story? This says the Pharisee now, the Pharisees are the good godly people. They know the protocol. I know the call and everything like that. But they had an attitude because there was a sinful woman who crashed the party. And because she saw that Jesus was not attended to in the right way, she decided to take the opportunity to get what she needed. I promise you I'm going to keep this car rolling. But I'm not going to press my way to Truthville to leave here with something I don't need. So if that means I got to press my way to the altar, I'm going to press my way and make sure I don't leave until I leave with what I need. So she crashed the party and then she began to weep because she understood who was in her presence and she realized that as long as I can press my way to the master, everything I need was right there. And some of us need to press our way to the master to realize and understand that the things that you have gone through is because God is not through using you. Oh, I wish y'all talked to me. And so here in the text, the people of God, they was upset because she decided to weep at the master's feet. And then they had the attitude and they said, well, if he really was the prophet, then they would know who it was that was crying over his feet. If they really knew the life that she lived, that they would understand that the oil that she has ain't even worthy. Can I help you tell you why she's still worthy? Because she did two things. She was willing and she was able. She was willing and she was available. And many times we fight for the position and the power and the title, but we forget that as long as I'm standing right here and I'm willing and I'm able, sooner or later, my name will get called. <laughs> It's not my position that got me where I am. It's not how hard I knew people that got me where I am. But it's because I stayed at the master's feet that he allowed for my gifts to make room for me. I need somebody to understand that the oil on your life is opening doors that no man can close. The oil on your life is opening doors that no man can close. The oil on your life, it matters. Let me hurry up, y'all. I don't got a whole bunch of time. The next thing that she reminds us is that she had a heart of worship. She had a heart of worship. She says, listen, I know I'm not even worthy to call upon your name, but yet because I heard that you are the same man that died for the saints and the ants, here I am without one plea. All I want to do is sit at your feet. If you, even if you don't remember my name, as long as I sit right here, I know I'll be made whole. That sounds like to me, the woman with the issue of blood. I don't got to sit there and see Jesus, but as long as I press my way and I get in his presence, my heart of worship will give me access to everything that I need. My oil will continue to flow because the things that I've been through allow me to pull somebody else through. You ought to thank God for your heart of worship. You ought to thank God that you're willing and able. I might not be a Khadijah James that owns the Time magazine. I might not be a raging hunter who thrives off of her beauty. I might not be a Maxine Shaw who's the baddest attorney in NYC. I might not be a Kyle Barker who wins in all the stocks. I might not be a Owen and Wakefield who can fix everything, but I just might be a Sinclair James that as long as I'm in the room, atmospheres change. That as long as I'm in the room, things have to work for me. That as long as I'm in the room, Your oil is still worthy. Your oil is making 
making a room for you. It does not matter how will you press your way. It just matters that you did. It does not matter how bad you think you've messed up. But it does matter that you made up with God. It does not matter how high I may go. As long as I remember that I got here because grace and mercy won my case. The songwriter says, I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. I'm going to my seat because I'm getting winded now. But I need you to tell somebody that my oil matters. My oil matters. My oil matters. My oil matters. Andre Johnson, the main character in this show, Blackish, betrays a man trying to find his cultural identity in a predominantly white space. Each episode, Andre is faced with the question if he has allowed his family to assimilate to the culture in order to gain momentary success. Moreover, he has to ask himself the question, has he sold out and lost his sense of identity. And so Andre has inner battles and tensions about how do I affirm my history while also trying to navigate my future in life. And this story is just a televised rerun of many of our lives as Africans in America. We too have inner tensions. Where is the line between assimilation and accommodation? to leave our hair natural and curly or to struggle finding a job who will accept us, to put on our white voice or to deal with not being taken seriously, to be overly nice all the time or to be called an angry black woman or an angry black man, to work twice as hard with a smile on our face or have society present you with glass ceilings. And really, what Dre and many of us are dealing with is what historian Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham calls a politics of respectability, which simply is our feeling that in order to be successful and to be heard, that we always got to be well-dressed, well-spoken, and maintain a sense of dignity no matter what humiliations and embarrassments are imposed upon us. We are just like Dre and we wrestle with what W.E.B. Du Bois calls double consciousness. Where we question should I be loyal to being African or should I be loyal to being an American? We are like Dre and sometimes we struggle in this culture to be black or to be black ish and while clicking through some episodes of this sitcom I find it interesting that sometimes in Andre Johnson's life he gets caught up by the calling of culture and the smell of success that he has a momentary eclipse of what he has been taught he has a momentary eclipse of where he comes from he has a momentary eclipse of who he is that sometimes life gets real good for him that he neglects his roots that sometimes the sweet nectar of upward mobility and the possession of a nice job and staying in a nice neighborhood erodes his memory of history that the fancy clothes and shoes he's able to buy and wear makes him forget that the system he is working so hard to please ain't really meant for him to succeed in the first place and in majority of the episodes when Dre is caught up and strutting his his tail feathers his father comes to him and knocks him back into his senses and gives him a root awakening somebody say a root awakening 
Yeah, not a rude awakening, but a root awakening. This root awakening is the realization that you did not get here by yourself, but you are planted in a ground that somebody else tilled, and you are called to grow deep your roots in it so that you can grow from it. A root awakening is meant to remind you of who you are and whose you are. A root awakening is real realizing that when you are planted, you are planted on the shoulders of others who have come before you. And while there will always be an allure to chase fleeting success, we've always got to be reminded to be rooted in something. And some of us, just like Dre the sitcom, have allowed some of our roots to be choked out by the desire to prove ourselves to people who ain't even worried about us. We've allowed our roots to grow shallow, neglecting our deep and rich history, trying to chase the next dollar. We've allowed our roots to lie silent in the ground and die from a lack of knowledge and vision. And if we are not careful, our soul will become like a shooting star and it will float to and fro, but eventually it will dissipate. No, my melanated brother and sister, you've got to stick to your roots. Sometimes we need a root awakening to remind us where our roots lie. And such is the same message that our pigmented partner Paul is trying to relay in a letter to the church of Colossians. Paul puts pen to paper in prison and he writes some words to give us a root awakening for Paul realizes that some of us have put our roots in the wrong places and for the wrong reasons. And so in Colossians chapter 2 verse 6 he writes these words and now just as you've accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down in him and let your lives be built on him. And then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. And don't let anybody capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking, from spiritual powers of this world, rather than from Christ. What Paul is saying to us is that you've got to be rooted in something, otherwise you will be carried away by anything. And unfortunately, like Andre in the show Blackish, and like the church of Colossians in our text, some of our roots need an awakening because they were planted in the wrong soil and being watered by the wrong people. We have roots in the wrong places and we've been whisked away by empty philosophies and duped by high sounding nonsense that come from fickle human thinking that takes us away from our spiritual and historical root. We've been given high sounding nonsense that tickle the ear but don't feel the heart. We've been given high sounding nonsense that I got to keep up with the latest fashion trends. And, but we don't talk enough about generational wealth. We've been given high sounding nonsense that everybody can live the American dream and have a piece of the American pie. But we fail to ask the question, who's serving the pie? And what in the ham and eggs is it made of? We have been given high sounding nonsense from people who look like us, but who really ain't for us. But our political puppets serving the almighty dollar instead of serving their communities. Even in the church, we have veered away from our roots. We've been fed empty philosophies like that of prosperity gospel that guarantees you a new car and a new house. If you give the right amount of money to the pastor, we've been fed empty philosophies uh, like manifesting that if I think it or wish it if I burn enough sage if I wear enough beads if I talk enough to the universe then something will happen we've been fed empty philosophies that tell 
the black church to shut up instead of screaming for justice. And if you see any of these high nonsense mentalities, and if you hear of any of these empty philosophies, it's because bad fruit stems from bad roots. For if you got the right roots, then it will help to produce the right fruit. And I've come today to prescribe to you, Zion, that we need a spiritual root canal to pull you out of some bad soil that has contributed to internalized racism, to pull you out of some bad soil that is attributed to the cycle of church hurt, to pull you out of some bad soil that has you in need to be accepted by everybody else but Jesus to pull you out of some bad soil that has you changing who you are to fit the cookie cutter frame that people give you and to let you know that there is a place where your roots can be awakened that there is a place where your roots can live again that there is a place where your roots can grow deep that there is a place where your roots can flourish again and Paul lets us know that you ought to put your roots in Jesus somebody ought to shout Jesus for there is a place where you ought to be rooted where the soil is rich from the blood from his side there is a place where you ought to stay rooted where the S-O-N forever shines there is a place where you ought to stay rooted that gives you to live life and live it sublime and that place is in Jesus somebody shout Jesus and I wonder if there is anybody in the building today who knows that you've been rooted in Jesus that your identity ain't based in culture but it's in Jesus that your identity ain't based in titles but it's in Jesus that your identity ain't based in the latest trend but it's identified in Jesus that who I am and what I do is based in Jesus Christ who is the author and the finisher of my faith I'm done Zion but I wonder if there is anybody in the building today who is glad that you're rooted in Jesus I wonder if there is anybody who's glad today that you're rooted in his word I wonder if there's anybody today who's glad that you're rooted in his promises for the hymn writer says that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy name on Jesus name on Christ the solid rock I stand all in the ground is seeking sand you ought to turn to your neighbor and say neighbor stay rooted because if the storms don't cease and if the winds keep blowing in my life my soul I said my soul I said my soul has been anchored in the Lord you ought to turn to another neighbor and say I'm rooted in Jesus. I'm rooted in Jesus because he's the Prince of Peace, because he's the Lord of Lords, because he's the King of Kings. I'm rooted in Jesus because he's the Rock of Ages, because he's the Great I Am, because he's the Head of all Shepherd. I'm rooted in Jesus because he's the sun that shines. He's the bread of 
of life. He's water when I'm thirsty. I'm rooted in Jesus because he's my way over, my way under, and my way through. And I wonder if I can get somebody in here who knows that the Lord has brought you a mighty long way and you're stepping in the 2023 saying I'm rooted in Jesus. Is there anybody who's glad today and can give God praise because you know that you've got a good root in the J S U S that spells Jesus and you want to lift your hands toward heaven and say thank you for being all I need you to be thank you for being my protector thank you for being my grounding place thank you for being my growing place thank you for being everything I need you to be good night Zion but can I take a few minutes and praise my Jesus for he's been my root he's been my hope he's been my foundation he's been the rock on which I stand and I come to declare to somebody in here you ought to stay rooted Wow. Anybody rooted? Come on now. Are you rooted? God has used all four of these preachers. Learning to thrive in the face of hardship. Making necessary transitions. Oil that matters. And a root awakening. Every time the word of God is preached, it demands a response. You've heard the word tonight four times over under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Perhaps the Lord has spoken to you out of one or all of these messages as we stand to our feet. The first invitation is for salvation. We never assume that everybody who comes to a church meeting knows Jesus Christ. We never take for granted that everybody is rooted so we want to give you an opportunity tonight to get rooted in Jesus Christ. We offer Christ to you. If you're here and you're not saved, you've never been saved. Every sin you've ever committed or ever will commit has already been atoned for at Calvary. Jesus Christ paid the sin debt. And he gives you and I a choice. To decide where we're going to live when we check out of this world. If you're here and you're not saved, there are counselors here. We invite you to come forward. We'll pray with you. We'll talk with you. Are you here? Are you here? Come. The next call. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you are struggling to thrive in the face of your hardships. Maybe you've gotten stuck 
in your transitions. Maybe your oil has dried up. Or just maybe you've somehow become unrooted and ungrounded in your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you just need to pray. We open the altar. We invite you to come. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Even if you're sick and you need healing, Jesus is still a healer. Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. If you need to pray tonight, I invite you to come. Just, just come. Just come by faith, trusting that the Lord will move on your behalf. You do know he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine according to the power that is at work in us by Christ Jesus in the church throughout all ages. Just come, just come. Maybe you don't need prayer, but maybe you know someone who does. Stand in the gap for them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They're still coming. God is still moving. He's still touching hearts and minds. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to first thank you for your messengers and the messages that each of them uniquely brought in a powerful and anointed way that you've spoken to us tonight out of your word. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll bless each of these preachers, that you'll renew them and strengthen them, that they might continue to carry out the assignment that you've placed before them. And now, Lord, we pray for those who have come tonight. You know every individual. You know their names. You know their situation. And Father, we come right now in the name of Jesus, praying that you would meet each of them at their every point of need. Whatever the struggle, whatever the stress, whatever the strain, whatever the striving, we know you can meet them right now in the name of Jesus. Whatever the worry, whatever the woe, oh God, whatever they're fretting over or fearing over, we bring it to you right now in the name of Jesus and we pray that you will touch them in the name of Jesus by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray you will meet every need in this house right now in the name of Jesus. Those who are going through hardships and transitions, those who are going through pain and going through suffering and grief and anger and danger Oh God, in the name of Jesus, we bring it to you right now. And we say, have your way, have your way. Do what you want to do as long as you want to. Oh God, we pray that they will not go to their seats the same way they left. You know what each one of us needs tonight. And so, Lord, we thank you. We praise you for doing a mighty work and for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, we thank you. 
and in Jesus name we pray amen now come on let's celebrate God for the preachers and for the words that the Lord sent tonight come on and give him glory hallelujah hallelujah God bless your saints go to your seats thanking the Lord for meeting all of your needs amen amen Reverend Kathy Henderson will now come with our announcements. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. We have a declaration that we have released that we are drinking from the well. And we are like the woman who was at the well. And uh, we're drinking from water where we will never thirst again. So if you are here and you are thirsty, you will be, your thirst will be quenched. And if this wasn't the night that it was quenched for you before you leave here, you will declare that you will not thirst again because of the living water that you have received. Just a few announcements on tonight. If you have children with you that you have registered, please make sure that you uh, register on Kid Check. We're doing a new thing and we have digital registration. So please sign up your children in Kid Check so that they can be easily checked in and out for Barracks Children Winter Camp. Um, also want to remind you that um, Yakum, the, uh, they're preparing for a brunch. They're selling tickets. They're $30. You definitely want to get in on that. It's going to be really good. They're also doing their membership drive, so please feel free to join uh, Yakum. Uh, in the morning, you do not want to miss Pastor Charlie Dates of Chicago coming with a powerful word about our um, unknotting our roots of our faith is going to be great. And for the youth assembly, you have Reverend Jonathan Moore. It's going to be a powerful word there as well. There is something for everyone here over the next couple of days, and we don't want you to miss anything. Finally, if you are a chaperone, we love you. And we want you to make sure that you are loving on your youth and on your children and that they are everywhere they're supposed to be. And that when it's time for them to be in their rooms, they're in their rooms and they're doing everything that they're supposed to be doing in their rooms quietly after a certain hour. All right, so uh, please make sure that you're doing that. We appreciate you doing it. Uh, after we close out, please make sure that you make haste in moving out of this room so that worship and arts rehearsals may begin. They will be happening immediately following this service. And then once worship and arts end, chaperones, what are you going to do? Make sure that back how, how many minutes after? within 30 minutes after the end of Worship Arts. Make sure that they are back in their rooms. All right, thank you. Don't you love how pleasant she was when she was telling us to act right? Amen. She, just as sweet as she could be, but don't get it twisted. She meant every word of that. Amen. Beloved, We've had some of our leaders to join us since they were last presented. And let me remind you, people of God, it is always right to honor godly leadership. You honor yourself when you honor godly leadership. And so we are delighted to have members of the Board of Bishops who is, are the leaders in the life of our church. Would you join me again in celebrating and recognizing the host bishop, Bishop Michelangelo Frencher from the Midwest Episcopal District. Would you celebrate and recognize with us Bishop Brian R. Thompson, the presiding bishop of the Western Episcopal District. Would you celebrate and thank God for Bishop Eric Leak, the presiding prelate of the Southwest Delta Episcopal area. Let's thank God for Bishop Nathaniel Jarrett, the second vice president, vice chair of the Board of Christian Education. We've also had with us Bishop George Walker and Bishop Warren Matthew Brown, both retired. Let's thank God for their leadership. We thank God for our missionary supervisors who are joining us. Mrs. Davida Moore, amen, from Mid-Atlantic Episcopal District. 
Mrs. Jelena Vicky Frencher, host missionary supervisor from the Midwest Episcopal District. Mrs. Jean uh, Holmes from the South Atlantic Episcopal District. Past international president, Dr. Sandra Gatson. Thank God for her. Amen. And we thank God for Dr. Brenda Smith, the immediate past general secretary of Christian education. Again, let's celebrate our general secretary of Christian education, the Reverend Patrick Barrett, and the third vice chair of the Board of Christian Education, Mrs. Ava Swinton. God bless you. We're going to ask Bishop Frencher to come now and offer the benediction as we depart. Would you bow your heads? And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy to the only wise God, our Savior Jesus Christ, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace and may the God of peace go with you.